Okay, so let's get started on today. Um, some really, really quick announcements. Portrait Studio will be released for Mac February 1st. If you don't own Portrait Studio, um, uh, you'll be able to own it for Mac. If you currently own it and bought a PC version, you'll have to purchase it again for Mac. Um, unless otherwise discussed with me way back in September sale, uh, those for those um, like handful, one or two students who sent me emails uh, requesting permission to buy their copy for whenever Mac comes out. Um, and I had already uh, let everyone know that that was an option, but not a lot of people took it. They used Wine instead, or they just didn't read properly and ended up buying a software uh, that was not for their system. Uh, they just thought it was going to be for Mac. Uh, so you'll have to buy it again if you want it to run um, uh, on Mac and run well. And then we have the Villain Challenge February 1st. Please get started on your blueprints, on your um, stories. Please get uh, some mood boards ready. I will release the resource pack for requirements and the official brief uh, for the challenge. The challenge will run for a month. And it will, I usually take, well, I, I took one last year. I'll probably take one this year. Something of a, an extensive break um, in March, at the start of March, end of February. So the challenge will be live uh, the first day I'm back. Um, and then, uh, and that is when it will be due. So probably March, the second week of March is when the challenge will be due. So you may say you have a lot of time, but that time will just pass like that. Uh, so if you do want to be a part of the villain challenge and win a portrait studio, um, win a resource pack, like a really cool resource pack full of my brushes. Um, the contests are, the contest component is now embedded. And I didn't do a contest for the last challenge because last year I had a breakdown and I needed to take a break. Nothing ran smoothly, so the whole contest was kind of messed up and I ended up looking at Creepy Creature. And um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the integration challenge, the environment character integration challenge separately through different critique hours. Um, instead of one dedicated stream, but hopefully this time around my health will uh, uh, keep and I'll be able to do exactly what I have promised to you guys. Um, uh, so if you want to support and uh, join us for this month's uh, challenge on Patreon for the apprentices, you can join. You still have a, a, a lot of time to complete your assignment. Uh, the first day back is the first Tuesday of every month, so uh, February 5th will be our critique hour, the private apprentice critique hour stream, um, and you'll be able to submit your stuff there. Um, if you feel like the challenges for apprentices are a little bit too advanced for you, you can backtrack into 2018 challenges. Uh, some of those grayscale studies, basic portrait studies, and form studies, they all come with a critique hour uh, that is attached to them. So, um, you know, the critique hour I, I offered the students. Uh, so that'll be a really, really nice... <coughs> way for you to ease into the assignments as they advanced throughout the year. I really started with studies and moved into more advanced character design illustrations, really, really highly bent on teaching students how to write as much as draw because they're two sides of the same coin. Um, and uh, so if you're interested, and you'll also be supporting the, the, the community in your own way. Um, and uh, that's it. Let's get started. Last week, I told you guys to hand in Sorry, I ate my lunch really fast. I must have finished, like, all my lunch in, like, two minutes. So, um, I'm going to be a little bit <laughs> burpy. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, but, yes, last week I told you guys, uh, last Tuesday, um, I told you guys to hand in some form studies so we can talk about form studies because last week's class was all about how important form studies are to you being able to sustain a uh, long uh, workflow without needing reference too much or depending too much on reference um, and like a crippling amount of dependence on references. So form studies help relieve you of that dependence because you learn um, a val value climb patterns, you learn the way values climb, you understand what they do around a specific, the nature of the geometry, you memorize molar brush strokes um, that belong to geometric groups that can be used later on in your uh, gallery, in your portfolio, in any object that you're going to draw. Um, it all comes back in that way. Okay, so let me see where I want to start off with and what the, some of the issues are that I see. <clears throat> there is a, for, a light environment issue that happens with form studies. So uh, form studies, what they do is that they help you render the object before it becomes a subject. Um, so we've talked about this a lot. You guys know the power of a form study, but for those who are new, a form study is a very simplified object that has no 
real purpose other than just to be the, you know, it doesn't have any specific label to it other than just to represent the specific edge. It gives you an opportunity to make a mistake with the edge. It gives you an opportunity to add more mileage with that specific kind of edge. Um, it lets you practice your radial shading. It gives you the opportunity to paint a variety of different combinations of value climbs or it gives you a variety of things. It exposes you to all the stuff that is form, all the detail and rendering. So that next time you're drawing a character, a sleeve or a collar or a necklace um, is not that difficult to wrap your head around because you've already assessed it before the necklace label was attached. You understand how to, how to create that basic climb and values along a sphere. So the more of these that you do, <clears throat> the more form studies that you work on, the more mileage that you're adding, and you're adding a very universal mileage. The problem, though, is that students forget to add the subject back in sometimes, um, or when they go back to the subject, they go back to lines. So the best thing you can do is, as you are using your form studies um, to improve the way you draw, um, and as you perfect the simple form study of the cube, advance it into a polygon where the cube gets more and more advanced. A lot of you for the homework that we've seen today uh, have tried the advanced shape way too early. Um, these are students that don't even have the cube down. You may think the cube is easy peasy, but I'm, I swear to God, uh, the form study is a really deceptive little study topic because it makes you think that, wow, this is so simple. I know how to choose these values, but then you come down to it and you have no idea what value to choose for the background. It all looks right, but at the same time looks wrong and you don't know how to fix it, that's because you guys still, a lot of you still are suffering from this contrast dependency and you guys still don't have your head wrapped around the cube very well. Um, so trying these advanced shapes is not good for your development because the point of a form study was not to give you this, I mean this is a good globular study for organic patterns, um, but it's definitely not serving the purpose of a form study, which is to expose you to the core patterns and values um, and the way they behave. So, so obviously your bread and butter is your edges, uh, the two types of edges, one object in front of the other, and a fold or a break in the object, such as the edge of a cube. And then you have the different ways to detail, shrinking your brush, adding contrast, sharpening edges, um, and uh, adding saturation. Then there are the rules of depth. The further the object is, the blurrier, the smaller, the higher on the horizon line, uh, the more faded. <clears throat> the object that is closer to the canvas, the closer to, I mean, closer to the camera is darker, bigger, overlaps other objects, higher contrast, sharper edges. And if there's a motion blur, or it's not motion blur, or like a foreground blur, of course you would blur accordingly if you want that effect. So you have the chance to, to experience all of these um, happenings of form without ever having to write a story or go through the creative process. Some days you just don't feel like drawing anything and in order for you to successfully <coughs> cover as much space as possible um, in that day's study without wasting it on sketching a face or sketching a, a half good face or something like that is to uh, dedicate it to uh, your mileage to do as much work for your, for your future um, endeavors as possible and that's a form study and form study is an insurance policy that you what's the what's the what that you that you sign that that makes sure that the next time you encounter this specific organic pattern the next time you have to work on a gradient that you will know exactly how large your brush is supposed to be second time third time fourth time you're not going to know exactly what to do but a good month or two of form studies organic and geometric uh, organic and geometric as they advance into more globular um, uh, organic patterns like body parts and polygons and architectural um, subjects. I, as you advance, um, you'll learn to bridge the gap between object and subject and you won't lean back into the lines the next time you try uh, to paint a, an object after one or two form studies. So if you go back to your habits, you'll forget what the form study was all about. Form study isn't just one or two I mean, some students do have a revelation by study one and study two. They start seeing the form study in everything. Um, they see the cube everywhere, which is a really, really good sign. I'd say the cube is the most challenging thing for students because that is where you actually start thinking about the space behind your object in your canvas. 
Your canvas is a small, I mean, it's a flat, closed off space in your mind. And that's why lines seem so friendly. But when you're working in a canvas and you imagine the canvas as being the inside of a cube, you actually have a z-axis <clears throat> and space behind the character, uh, the space behind the object. You start thinking about balanced light and light direction and that something can fill this space up. So a form study and the cube are all about volume, adding that extra bit of chunk to what you're drawing, that volume, that fat, that, uh, that fullness, that girth, that width. Um, you're adding that back to anything that you draw. The problem and danger factor with circular, or spherical, or organic form studies is that you guys love blending. You guys just live for blending because apart from your lines, blending was the only thing that was keeping your paintings together um, so that you can live long enough or your paintings can last long enough so that you can call yourself an artist. Um, and it worked and it worked for a while and blending became something as damaging to your gallery as the lines were. So when we talk about globular studies like these, talk about these um, organic form studies, what I want to emphasize is that, <clears throat> first of all, you must study the sphere and the cylinder at the same time. And we only start blending and enlarging our smudge brush after we've established the, the core shadows. In a form study, the, in an organic form study, the core shadow is so defined, you can block it in. The, the point of not using a blocking brush and using a soft brush is that we are... <clears throat> allowing you to build efficiently and blend at the same time as you're climbing. Uh, so that's radial shading. The first brush stroke is very low opacity and then as you keep climbing it like a little sand pile, you start climbing the highest point and then you get this little point. So this is brush one, brush two, brush three, brush four until you shrink it and climb the valley. You're blending automatically. What you never do is erase the core shadow. The core shadow is so important and the one danger, the, the number one danger to a core shadow is a soft brush. Uh, write that back to me. So can anyone describe why a soft brush is dangerous before I get into, uh, get into painting some of these? <clears throat> why is a core shadow, why is a soft brush dangerous for a core shadow? Um, so let's see. Okay. Um, form is the insurance policy that you sign that makes sure the next time you encounter a form, you'll know what to do. Uh, the number one danger to a core shadow is a soft brush. Any idea why? You lose definition. A soft brush is the, the, the dangerous. Uh, number one danger because it kills the edges. Well, you don't have an edge in a core shadow um, on, a, on, a, on an organic shape. <clears throat> Soft brush has a wide radius and no hard edges, so it can wipe out established edges and values, definitely. But what is it about its wide edge that is dangerous? Someone can still see that opacity there and they can still avoid those areas. But I'm talking about a soft brush on core shadows on an organic object. Why is it dangerous to use a soft brush um, consistently? Why is it dangerous to use a soft brush on an arm or a body for too long? Uh, what does the soft brush do? The fuzzy edges, excellent. That low opacity outer edge is actually damaging any values established. It'll bring in gradients between core shadow and mid-tone, they'll keep introducing mid-tones and shadows to each other um, that uh, uh, that have this uh, uh, defined separation between them based off either the direction of the light source or there's enough blending in that area that it doesn't need any more excessive blending or there is an actual edge there. Uh, so though I do recommend a lot of you use soft brush for your form studies, be very careful um, with with this and that forms that even a sphere was once a cube 
If you think like that, you'll remember that the sphere has a volume to it. It has fat to it and a z-axis. So the mother of all shapes, and some people like to argue that it's the cylinder. Well, because the cylinder keeps coming up in through quarter view and organic bodies and, I mean, organic uh, form studies and reference um, references of, of anything, you know, that has any kind of organic shape to it or any kind of pattern to it, anatomy studies, um, that the, the, the cylinder is the first shape people see. But the mother of all shapes is the cube. Uh, because that is where the student starts to realize the low poly version, the, the derivative, the, um, the, the, the lowest common denominator of all shapes is a shape that uh, highlights three major, uh, not highlights a bad word to use in this case, uh, that identifies three major sh uh, values, which is the highlighter, the midtone, and the shadow, and then, of course, identifies the power of the edge and the core shadow and how everything can be um, boiled down to its basic cube equivalent. So an arm, the forearm, is a rectangular prism. The upper arm, um, the shoulder area, all cube. There's the top of your shoulder, which is the top of the cube, and then there's the sides, which is the side of your bicep area. There's the back, which is your shoulder blades, and there's the front, which is the part leading into your collarbones and chest. A cylinder may trick you into thinking it has access to all of those areas, um, um, uh, in a way that it helps you identify uh, your values, but it's not, go it's, the cylinder is the final shape. It's a cylindrical blending, but it's a geometric formulation. It's a geometric way that you've built the character. You started off with a cube and then advanced it into a cylinder by carving away or adding fat. So the skeleton, and I don't mean actual skeleton, the skeleton of your form is always going to be cube-based. So last week we were talking about referencing um, how to stay strong to, without using references. <clears throat> of course you want to, once you start blending, to identify the core shape beneath that. Sometimes you don't have a cube base to things like lips uh, or a chin. A chin doesn't have a very cube-like um, uh, uh, pattern in the shadows to it. So you would say a cylinder would be an excellent shape to memorize in your form studies. But I think that um, every major curve can be broken down into its cube, its low poly equivalent, because the core shadow is still such a defined location. It has such a s specific border. When the light hits, there's always a part where the core shadow starts <clears throat> that defines, that denies the light indefinitely and defines the edge of the core shadow. So the cube is the most important thing. If you're curious, where do I start with my form studies? I think I've done form studies that are a bit too advanced for me. Go back to the cube, go back to polygons, go back to random geometric shapes um, so you can get a better uh, grasp over all the geometric uh, uh, shapes that you're going to encounter. Why are they important? Because a geomet geometric shape guides your brush and your brush needs to stay large and your large brush with your opacity um, you can block and sculpt with it with a, with a confidence that the brush strokes you are laying down all lead back to the cube. Why do I study what, what comes after that? All those really complex geometric shapes, your cylindrical shapes, your spheres, how to blend, how to raise your values, how to create a believable skin, uh, how to create a believable organic pattern in any, <clears throat> you know, any organic surface you're ever going to have to deal with. They're all, everything's curved. Um, well, that's because you're, uh, you know, you're constantly thinking in the cube. You're not going to miss the core shadow in the, in the organic patterns because what happens is that uh, the organic patterns, uh, like I said, are all just a really rounded off cube. They still have that volume to them. A curve may seem like it's the most easy thing to do, but it actually curves along the z-axis. So it curves with a bit of perspective in it. And when you're doing only globular form studies, because you're sk a lot of students that I worked with skipped their geometric because they knew they were just going to round everything off. And then they got smart and thought that, you know, their core shadow is exactly where they needed it to be. And, you know, as long as I can find my core shadow, I don't really need to block. I can just go straight into the blending. But they forget that a lot of the curves that they're working with curve into perspective. So they forget how to add radial shading to the far side of a three-quarter view. Um, and they forget how to drop the values down. They drop the values down linearly um, instead of around the cube, around the z-axis. There is a z-axis in a sphere. Write that down. 
Um, and that's to do with the fact that, you know, you're forgetting the space around the object and you're painting for the camera. You're not painting for the space around the object. Don't paint for the camera. Don't tilt perspective to the camera. Um, and all of these little points, these little uh, uh, markers here should help <clears throat> identify what really should be prioritized when you start moving into form studies, what should be kind of left until the two-week period of geometries is, is done. I usually make my students um, kind of stick to your, their geometric shapes for as long as possible and only slowly start introducing radial shading um, and then asking them to curve their edges uh, on their geometric objects. That's really the, 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 that's how cautious I am with, with organic form studies. They tend to trick the student back into thinking it's all about blending. But the reason why we spent so much time on the cube is because the core shadow is the number one thing that's missing all the time. Students forget the direction of the light source. They forget the essential main shadow that defines the object's nature as it is denying light. So that's just what my thoughts are about form studies for anyone who's you know never really thought about them, who's new to the channel who has, you know, who they've heard of them, they've seen them, but they think it's an optional study. No, it is the backbone of this community. Form studies have everything to do with everything that we do. Form studies have removed all of the glam and glamour of, of color and detail and sparkles and character design and have left behind um, the real sciences and creating an illusion of a third dimension, the artificial extra third dimension in your canvas that makes your canvas looks like it's a window to another world. That's what a form study is. So you have to do your form studies. Form studies are mandatory. They're not fun. They're not a trend. They're not just they're fun, but they're not just to be fun. They're, they're not a trend. They're not optional. Form studies are mandatory. And I've never had a student who had, did not have at least 100 form studies done under my tutor, tutoring. Um, so let's get into this. Light environment is, again, one of the things that you guys miss out on a lot. And that's because um, you never really think about the space surrounding the, the object. And because of that, you forget how that space affects the values as they're visible in the objects, um, on, the, on the object's positive space. So the negative space here, you guys put it last. You guys assume that it is not relevant to how we're choosing these values. First of all, it's not the right brightness. Oops, select inverse. <clears throat> it needs to be a bit brighter in these areas because the amount of sharpness in the shadow. So a sharp shadow is a strong light. A strong light means the environment around the object has that some of that light in it. All right, so I'm just basing it off the sharpness of your cast shadow. Um, and then we have the bounce light. So your organic shapes, which is another really, really tricky, annoying thing about organic shapes and spheres and cylinders is that they are so susceptible to bounce light it is impossible not to see bounce light on an organic shape in this world like if you're holding up any kind of ball there's always some level of bounce light on it because of the way it is shaped it is so unified it's just one side it's constantly turning there's no edge deny light with any specific edge or or, 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 um, or bend in the direction of the, of the surface area. Perspective is almost always showing and there's always a gradient attached in there somehow. So when it comes to a cast shadow being cast on an object that has a surface facing the light source, that cast shadow doesn't get to stay dark. There's just such a unified shape. Also, it's a bright shape so that light gets to bounce back a little bit. And shadows cast on bright organic surfaces are diffused. Sometimes um, they're more so diffused than uh, cubes, but cubes also get, diff of course they get diffused um, as the object falls on a cube of surface that is bright. That cast shadow, if it's in a, that sharpness level, will be, um, it will be illuminated. But because, it, because it's only a flat surface and that cast shadow is traveling along a flat surface like this cube here, um, it doesn't really get that extra dimension of that surface slowly curving away from the, from the light. So I'm just trying to recapture my select inverse. All right, and I'm just cleaning this up. So there's that bounce light. And then there's the bounce light of this flat surface here. So flat surfaces are great reflectors. 
and if it's just one flat surface facing down, then that flat surface is going to get a little bit of bounce light on it. And if after you've quantified all of these cast shadows, they have the same value, that's okay. All right. And then this can stay dark because it's completely denying the light. It's not really exposed to any nearby bounce light. Remember, bounce light sometimes has already been factored in the value you've chosen. So bounce light isn't always traceable. So for you, when I say bounce light, you guys see this. Right? You guys see that? Sometimes bounce light is this. And that's it. The, the bounce light is so wide, you don't actually find a traceable uh, a bar of it along the side of the object, especially on a curved object like this. Then we have bounce light on objects that are generally flat, um, but it's not a consistent bounce light all the way around. It's going to be a bounce light that gets thinner towards this inner pocket here that doesn't really face the light source. And this again is why globular foam studies are so dangerous because there's all these gradients constantly happening. They're not gradients, they're radial shades. <clears throat> I try not to say gradient because students love blending from edge to edge, dark to light, super soft, airbrush. Um, it looks like a gradient because of our perspective. In fact, it does grow radially. We're just not looking at the, at the top of the pimple, let's say. Really bad example, but <laughs> I hope you remember it. Um, then there's the way the light is exposed, the, what the, some objects are exposed to the light. So this sharp area here is all kind of that sharp because there's a lot of light on the object. That light here is going to also hit the surface just like that. So what we're doing is climbing our values radially. I'm just creating this little band here. This surface is bouncing light, so this little shadowed pocket isn't going to get to stay that dark. Even though this area down here gets to stay that dark, nothing that open or reflective or dome-like is there for this lower lower patch here. The cube is fine, but the way you've rendered the cube, the shadow on the cube is a little bit too dark. So remember, a shadow is only as dark as the surface allowing it, um, or the surface on which it falls. So something that's safer to do for your cast shadows is just use the shadow color instead of just trying to represent the pocket. The, the pocket, which is right here, this little pocket area, is not, it's so small, it's so out of the way, you don't have to worry too much about representing it. Also, there isn't enough light in this area to reveal this much of the highlighted part of this notch. So, you don't have to make it that dark. <clears throat> it's also part of a cast shadow already. It's part of a shadowed area, so you don't actually get that little cast shadow in there. You can't have cast shadows casting inside cast shadows. Um, you can have uh, some softer version of a nearby secondary light. You can have a softer version of a cast shadow within a cast shadow, but it's not a sharp cast shadow. It's something that is just the gradual radial uh, development of a cavity or something like that. So what you can do here, um, because it's already in a shadow, the best and safest thing to do is to just give it a shadow color for the entire notch. Or what I like to do is just use the shadow color at the top and the bright color towards the bottom and just paint just with as much shadow as possible and using brightness only where by comparison, the area would be brighter. There isn't enough exposure here to allow this area to be in cast shadow. There's just the angle of the of the edge is just not there. So a shadow like that is more than enough, or a shadow using the shadow color just like there. <clears throat> and then for here, what's happening is that the cavity is exposed to the light source, so you really wouldn't have that little bit of dark in the open mouth. Not that much dark anyway. You definitely did a wonderful job representing it. Really good job, really good radial shades. But because the light is directly shining into that little mouth, let's say, this little cast shadow is a touch too dark. 
And the further these objects get from the light source and the further the receiving object gets from the main object, the fuzzier the cast shadow. And so this is all preparing you for one day when you're going to have this or variation of this combination of shapes in an illustration. You'll know what to do. You'll know how to think about the direction of the light source. But everything we've referenced right now, we've constantly gone back to the word light source. Um, and this is the main benefit of working with form studies. You remember the light source. The light source is coming from the top, so that means we don't have an outline of shadow at the top of the cylinder. It's just bright at the top. Same thing over here. We don't have that much shadow, and we have most of the shadow pulling towards the bottom. Select inverse. So I'm just going to bring in a bit of a dark value here so I can show you. Oh, are you kidding me? Why? Select inverse. Okay. So I'm just using the edge of my brush only. That's how much paint you have on the edge of a soft brush. Really dangerous to forget about the power of that soft brush and use it for things that it's just not intended for. And then usually always on the highest point of every cylinder, there's a little bar of light. This side isn't as displaced from the light source as the bottom, so it shouldn't be as dark. Remember that everything has arrows emerging from it, revealing the direction that everything is looking in. And every side looks in a direction, and it's just one more reason why organic form studies are so difficult. Like why they're scary, I would say. And why they're not the best thing to assign students sometimes. Um, because one, they're, 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 they have the illusion of being easy, and two, they don't have that simple representation of surface area exposure to light source, that simple formula that we follow. So imagine that on a cube, everything has a line perpendicular to the surface emerging from it. Um, I'm just going to use my... Okay, so this is perpendicular exactly 90 degrees. This is perpendicular. <clears throat> and the one down here and the light has a bunch of arrows coming out of it, revealing where the light is looking at. Sometimes the light is just a simple cone, like it comes from a different, a specific direction. So all the light moves in this kind of radius here. All right, so between A, B, C, and D at the bottom, and these other sides that we don't see, which would be the most exposed? It would be A. And then everything else is just a step down from how bright A is. And A is layered on top of a base tone you give to the shape, considering what color and um, exposure that shape is in this environment. So t a sphere is just a hell because it's got a, for every single, let's just say we have a sphere and we zoomed into this part. And we zoomed, we zoomed in so close, our picture, we no longer see the curve, right? Just like we can't see the curve of the earth until we're really, really high. We no longer see the curve. So for every single one of these guys, we barely see a curve, there's an arrow. But that arrow, though they may, they may look like they're all looking in the same direction, they're slowly curving. And so these guys, on average, look in this direction. This looks in this direction. But then you have these transition values in between, and that's the gradient. The gradient is that it's slowly rejecting the light. And then you have the brightest parts here climbing this way, the darkest parts climbing this way. So this is easy. This is just a simple shape. But what about when it comes to a face and the three-quarter view angle on the far side slowly starts receiving shadow and denying light? How much shadow do you include? How do you make sure you rotate and apply every single little asshole arrow <laughs> that comes out of this globular surface? What about hills? What about dunes? Um, the things get a little bit more confusing, and then you also have to consider the fact that there's bounce light. Um, it's dangerous because it's not, I mean, it's not that hard. It's just, a, uh, at the end of the day, it's something we all have to do. We all have to do organic form studies, but it's something that would be better for you to do after you've established this diagram. Um, so spend more time on your cuboid, spend more time on your polys, anything that is a crazy representation of 
you know, uh, edge work and how edges really just control the entire scene. Anything that lets you uh, build a scene just with edges, um, cubes, low poly diagrams, sculpting, where you're building just with cubes, all of that is really good for your future with, uh, with blending. And this here, this little diagram, teaches you a better relationship with blending. It tells you exactly what blending is. Blending isn't just there to make things look nice. Blending has a purpose because things are either deriving from this pattern or this pattern. There's no other pattern. It's just these two. These are your canon. These are the pillars that keep your illustration together. These, these are the pillars here. Uh, organic form studies and geometric form studies. Geometric done first because on the geometry of a cube, the z-axis is important. Um, so if you want to, we can just outline your, 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 your geometric shapes. You can throw in extra little pieces here. You can, you can just go crazy, but as long as you are uh, exposing yourself to as much geometric patterns as possible. So you're always asking the question in the direction of the light source and then trying to quantify um, the arrow for every surface, the general direction of the light source, and embedding this formula in your mind permanently. <clears throat> Any questions at all about all this theory? All right, so what I'm going to do yep, is just select this and go to the previous version. A bit more bounce light, a bit more of an open space background being brighter means that we've explained why this cast shadow is so sharp. So can anyone explain and see how off this felt because you were using A values on B and C which makes no sense. It's impossible the light here just was not bent and light doesn't bend. Light can bend but it doesn't bend on its own and nothing is there, no black hole is there to bend it so we're gonna just assume that light always travels in a straight line and this value is wrong. Right, be more consistent with your value. I don't know, these are starting to look like lines to me. I'm not sure what you were doing here. If this was a cast shadow, it's hard for me to lasso this area. But that entire surface here should be bright, no shadow on it. This area gets gets dark and then we have a cast shadow coming off this ribbon on top of this ribbon. <coughs> Someone asked, what is the core shadow of a cube? The core shadow of a cube is a surface area. It's, it's, one, it's one of the faces of the cube. It can be both of them if the light is in a silhouette. Uh, the core shadow of this cube wouldn't be, uh, so let's just outline the cube. The core shadow of a cube is the most displaced surface area from the light source. All right, that's the one you look for. Unfortunately, the camera isn't always facing it, so we get the second best or second last. We get third last. That is your main core shadow. Sometimes you don't see all of the core shadow and understand why that's confusing. So A, B, C, D, what the hell? D, E, F, and then G is this one here. F and D are probably the core shadows if the light source is coming from here, mostly F. But we don't see F, we don't see D, we don't see E. We see A, B, C. And B here will be our inheriting core shadow. That's the one we paint. We don't worry about the ones in the back. We do consider them when we assign B a value by not making B dark as death because that's that wouldn't make any sense to its current position on the light source. So really, A looks at the light source, light source looks at A, but look at the angle displacement to get to B. It's not that big, but look at the 180 degrees to get to F. Okay, so that means that F really is the core shadow. This one is another 90 degrees, but it is facing down. You have to factor how far away, what which direction is facing. This one is also 90 degrees, but it's facing up so it's going to get more of that spray of light pointing down. Imagine there's an eye on every cube and it's looking out out uh, towards the surroundings, which is going to see the light, which is going to see the least amount of the light. Um, <clears throat> um, it's really just cast shadow received from an object blocking the light onto the surface and form shadow where the surface itself turns away from the light. 
yeah, the object and its interior shadows and cast shadows being anything that happens outside of the object. Um, within form shadow, you have terminator, core shadow, reflected light, occlusion. Um, excellent. Uh, any other questions? Uh, origami forms are great. Um, I wouldn't let you do that right away because there's a little fold in between each surface and that's a little bit of a a little bit of like a step forward in your in advancing your form studies. I would keep it very, very simple shapes for now. Probably 90% of the people watching uh, need to simplify their form studies and need to really perfect their understanding of bounce light, when to use it, subsurface scattering, when to use it, um, identifying the core shadow, knowing how, you know, wrapping your head around the safe way to use a soft brush, um, uh, you know, every, everything, everything that comes up, every last thing, how sharp your edges are supposed to be. Uh, these are all things you can still experience with a simple form study. And I don't mean all cubes all day. You can com com like create a little bit more of a complex cube. Definitely not an advanced polygon, but something early on and an early polygon. Um, uh, and many polygons beside each other, polygons casting shadows. Uh, polygons that are in the foreground, polygons in the very distance with a bit of uh, atmospheric fade. Then in your form studies, you can start adding a uh, horizon line, a surface. All your forms are grounded, casting shadows along a flat surface. That'll get you into drawing environments better, understanding architecture better, uh, perspective. Um, those are kind of ways to advance forward. But if you guys are trying these really, really advanced form studies, and I know for sure a lot of you are still having issues with, with the cube because let's just look at how much white you used. You used this much white, your cast shadows are this sharp, but look at your environment color. It makes no sense. Um, uh, you know, what you've done here with this curved edge on the side, uh, kind of like a laid edge, but then these areas here are black as well. Uh, but this is lighter and these are black, but they're cast shadows. The shadows are pure black. They haven't considered the fact that the shadow belongs to the surface on which it falls, which are these exposed areas, meaning the cast shadow should be brighter. Um, this little nose here isn't cast down here as a cast shadow. It's not really reaching, I guess. Um, way too much contrast in the way you're climbing your values up here, but I like how you preserve that edge. Um, your shadow starts really, really early, even though the edge starts later. Um, and then you have curving values, but the grain of the brush is straight not curved along the surface. Another thing, explain, revealing to you guys why organic form studies are a pain in the ding dong, because what we have on a basic form study, even an advanced polygon, is a nice flat surface, and we have one value per surface. We don't have gradients on a on a polygon. We don't have gradients on a um, on a cube. We, we just have the flat surface. That's because all anywhere you put an arrow, it's all looking in the same direction. Anywhere. That's why we're studying cubes, so that we know where to block consistent, specific values dedicated to one surface area. But when we get into these globular, scary motherfuckers here, we, um, see, I'm trying to swear, but I still swear, and I try not to swear. Um, we get these, you know, really difficult even to just sketch them out, these contour lines that just are ready to bite you in the butt. And then they have compression. So this, the, the closer they get to the edge, the more compressed because of perspective. And it's really, really tricky creating trace over diagrams of these guys. And for every single brush stroke, you have to follow the local contour lines as they move. See, I'm just, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, it can look like you know what you're doing when it comes to traceovers and then you realize, okay, I just added a bump where there shouldn't be one. Um, so this little edge here, this is where the light started rejecting. This is where that trend changed from this here to this. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we have the bottom of a cube, but your shadow starts here. Your shadow should have started somewhere down here. As curved as it needs to be, but it should have started lower. Um, and then another thing that you guys like to do is you guys like to, well, for those who really don't understand form studies, um, they'll do a point and then a gradient. 
instead of a point to represent how the point is an edge. A vertice is just an edge from the side. And or the exact opposite of this is way more common, a curve and then a sharp value instead of a gradient. Um, look out for these. These things happen early on. These things are fixable in early stages of form studies. You don't have to have a super advanced form study for you to experience all these fundamentals. You're just throwing a bunch of gravel in, in I don't know in what, you're throwing a bunch of gravel <laughs> in something and it's not letting you advance forward because you're making it way more complicated than it should be. Remember, form studies are simple but they represent complex basics. Write that down. Um, and the more simple you keep your form study, the less clouded your ability to, to, to identify these complex basics. All right, the more complex your form study, the more inaccessible the basics are. And uh, write that back to me. And simplicity does not, basic does not mean simple and, and, and Basic does not mean easy. Basic just means that they are the base level, val the fundamentals that keep everything together. All the stuff that I'm outlining here. Um, and of course, you know, that they'll just keep adding up as you go along, but they'll, you know, you'll eventually hit the cap of quantity of fundamentals. And at that point, you'll just start seeing things repeat themselves. There really is only so many things that happens on a gray cube and a gray sphere. Uh, in this world and you can capture all of them right away it's not scary and if you draw enough of these draw enough weird globular blobs draw enough um, form study polygons draw enough cubes cylinders pyramids uh, prisms you'll start to, to see these objects back when you reintroduce the shape you start to see these objects guide your brush stroke and if there's anything out there that helps you decide a brush stroke that's a good thing for you because the number one problem is hover rendering. The number one problem is guesswork, line, line dependency, shading outside in. Anything on the outside of the character is always just a little bit darker. That is when things start to just get ugly because, like for instance, shoulders. Every time I'm, I'm, I'm critiquing a character design, the shoulders, for some reason, let's say we've got shoulders here, the shoulders are always shadows. People forget that there is an essential cube shape here. The top of the cube sometimes can just be a very simple value leading into the edge towards the background, um, especially if the light is top down. There isn't enough shadow being developed. Maybe we'll see just like a hint of a core shadow, but that would start somewhere down here on the other side. Sometimes we just don't see it there, but there's always some kind of outline up here. And that's how far you guys have stretched and expanded the line and thought you got away with it. Sometimes we'll have shadows all the way on the top of the female, or like the, the breast area, all the way here at the top. And you guys understand how this is a bad, bad shadow because it's the top of, a, of an organic shape. It should all be bright. This is the core shadow line that goes up. But this is exactly the same shadow we're talking about. And this is just one example of the ways form, shadow, form, form studies can help you develop your shadows a little bit better. Identify these things. It's just one extra little problem you have in your drawings that it can erase. Three-quarter views. You guys always have the far side of your three-quarter views super, super dark. I don't know why. It, you guys either think, you know, the light source is running out because it's moving away from me, even though your shadows of your noses point down evenly, symmetrically down the face. The reason why you guys are getting these shadows out here is because one, line dependent, and two, you wouldn't recognize, uh, you would recognize that this area here, so this is the outline, this point up, all of the arrows started to slowly look, be look better at the light source, be more exposed. This line down, they started to look away. So this massive trend line here is where the core shadow develops. So we would have shadow beneath the cheekbone and that, that would slowly develop as well. So we would completely blend that out. Um, uh, and then that's what would you know allow you to have a shadow towards the far side of a three quarter view. And then above that on the cheekbone is when we start getting light. So this contour line is reflected on the interior. So what's ha whatever happens on the outside is reflected on the inside. So let's do a form study together, an organic one. And this class isn't, this is, this class is more of me warning you guys to be careful with your organic form studies and prioritize your, 
uh, geometric form studies, which if you're at a point where you're just bored of your geometric form studies, which is really hard to believe, um, then you can start moving into the more advanced uh, organic form studies. But this, what I want to do today, this demonstration, is mostly because um, a lot of you don't know how to add a core shadow, especially in response to the outer cues you set for yourself, these little cavities here. So I'm going to have a general area here. Um, I like, I'm just going to uh, apply like A, B, C, and D. Out of all of these, which of these cavities would be the darkest? If the light source <laughs> was coming from, let's just say, the top right. All right. Which of these would be the darkest? <coughs> Um, I'm just waiting for the answer. A. Okay, how about second darkest? Just say A, okay, then B, good. Then? I assumed that they would be B and A. A would definitely be the darkest because it's the most displaced. All right, so let's get started, so. So I'm going to bring in my darker value here, any dark value really, but my opacity goes down. What's the most, is, am I doing things right right now? Is this right? What's the first shadow I should be applying? Do I do these little grooves before I do something else? What's missing? What comes before these grooves? Second darkest B, D, mm-hmm. Okay, good. Nice. A, then B, then D, then C. I hope, I hope this was C up here, because <laughs> I forget which ones I labeled. <laughs> well, guessing is good. You know, it's part of the uh, learning process. I haven't blocked in yet. Good job, Sean. What haven't I blocked in? Terminator isn't even considered until bounce light is considered. Terminator is towards the end. That's just the leftover core shadow. Good. The core shadow of the object. If you were to summarize this object as one specific geometric equivalent, what would that be? No, Mr. Rack, you fool. You need the overall core shadow first. Where is that? What are my two defining uh, edges for this core shadow? So let's say, where does this core shadow sit? So we've got A point, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Where, where does this core shadow between which sections does it sit? between what and what? Radial shading of the two legs of the form. Planes. And I'm just gonna add in an extra little blob here. I'm just gonna outline it in because there's really no way to show it other than me outlining it in for you for now. So between which two lines does the core shadow stretch from? if the light is top down, mostly top, uh, from the right. There's no J, man. H, I, E and F? No. D and G? No. 
I and C. Or H and C. So the answer is I and C. These two are where if the light source was coming in from the top, it would start rejecting the light. The light doesn't access anything past these outlines here, these little vanishing points. All of this here is ex um, exposed to the light, maybe apart from this little cast shadow of this dude, but it just starts right up again. From I and C, these lines here, sorry, I don't know why I let it go that, that low, um, is where the core shadow starts. So any shape you're ever going to experience, any weird combination of whatever, if you know where the light source is coming from, all you have to remember is if I were to draw a straight line from the center of the light source down to the edge of the object, to wherever the object ends, so just keep drawing it, just as long as you're not piercing through the object, right? Wherever the object ends, that's where you should be starting your core shadow. So your core shadow will follow the contour lines around, depending on how rotated around the horizon, um, but your core shadow will do. All right, this is your core shadow. You know your core shadow does not end here because the light can still see to a degree. Then you have your subtle ch tiny little changes here and there so you've got uh, form shadow or another mini miniature kind of version of the core shadow and a cast shadow. And then you've got the general the fact that the, this part, let's say A, B, B is further from the light source. So B will get generally less contrast. Light gets weaker the further you get from it. And A will have the most contrast. And then highlights will mostly climb on A surface and a little bit on, um, let's say, C surface. Okay, so that's what I mean by core shadow. It's an actual defined area where the object's form starts to deny the light and the first descent away from the light happens uh, depending on the side. So, I'm doing all that. Let's get started. The light source is coming from the top down, and this is how I would do it. I'll add in this extra little bump later. So this is exactly how I do these form studies for my students. I just lower the opacity. One massive brush stroke. I don't care if it's not perfect. It's def definitely not going to be straight. It's going to be following the contour lines. See my brush, I'm trying to create this pattern with it. I'm trying to keep everything curved. All right, and then I'm going to decide which areas really are displaced away. So this obviously is the most displaced. It's okay if the values are not perfect yet. Diffusion always happens later and I'm shrinking my brush as I add. Then I'm going to start creating the cavities. All right, the light is coming from the top down so these areas might get a little bit of a drop. Then I'm going to do the inverse and identify where the highlights are. So this is all exposed to the light source. And I would say the point of core shadow really starting to get rejected is right over here. Just zoom out to make sure my volume is intact. Soft brush also really likes a low opacity. So you see how much paint I'm adding on the area that is rejecting? So remember how this is one of the points that was rejecting? See how much paint I have there now? And I only saw this once I zoomed out? That's how dangerous soft brush is. And this is why we paint in grayscale for a long time. We do this with every color. We do this with every possible combination of textures. Because on top of all of these rules, we just have a little bit more texture. Then we have a little bit of relief coming out of this little fella because he's got volume to him and he might be diffusing outside of the core shadow. So there will be components that move outside of the core shadow. And I'm just going to get my shadow color again. Nothing should be as dark as this neighborhood. Kind of looks like a funny little guy. <laughs> um, then the light is pointing down. We have a bit of a cast shadow here. Just a small cast shadow, nothing very extreme. And depending on what's happening on the surface here, 
This might be bending all the way through, but of course I have to make sure this does not borrow any of the neighborhood values here. So if I get this value and use it over here, it should look like a highlight, and it does, so check mark. If I take one of these values and try to use it on this side, it looks like a very extreme, doesn't belong there. And that's because the border we built, this little wall <laughs> we built between these two, should be um, nice and uh, concrete. <laughs> God. All right, and then we just factor in the texture of the object, so how much reflectiveness is possible. That's way too much opacity, it's right. right. And then sometimes we'll have a little bit of highlight towards the top. If I add that, I'm going to have to adjust the light environment. But one thing I start to do is I start to shrink the soft brush and really make sure that there is a border in between all of these edges. So this is kind of almost edge-like, this little section. And I'm learning, basically, I'm learning how to render around a face at the moment. I know it looks like a face here, but that's not the point. <clears throat> And then towards the top half is a little brighter, light axis at the top, pulling from the top and the bottom. And then I'm just going to decide how much shadow I want on the far side. Sometimes the light will be so strong, this surface will cast a shadow on this surface. Just like that, a little shadow. I'm going to use a darken mode for that. So this is the cast shadow of this guy. It's not a core shadow anymore. It's breached outside and it's now blocking the light rays instead of the light rays wrapping around. They don't really wrap around. They don't move, but it's just a figure of speech. Okay, and then I'm just going to get this guy here a little bit more volume and that's just shrinking my brush as I add paint. Don't do it too much because then it'll look like an outline. Top down. And I'm just going to tilt this and see if I'm missing anything. This might need more outward motion because it's like the chin. background value would work better if it was a bit brighter. And then there's of course the option of darkening your object as you need to to climb values back up. And these are the things I adjust just a touch each time not too much. And then bounce light that general change in the value that doesn't have a traceable rim that would just happen around here somewhere it's a value that's already been considered but extreme bounce light and that's when an object is really close to the surface this is that kind of bounce light when you have a page right beside or a reflector right beside and the leftover of the core shadow which would be this line here that would be the terminator all right so let's try another odd shape Oh, you know what? I'm just gonna. And then some weirdness there. All right. So that's a bit too dark. Just because I want to stay general values, the light will come from above, or uh, make the light coming from. I'll keep it from above because that's what we're trying to study. Is a character design type of setup. So the core shadow would be cutting across here. Right? And then some at the top. So that's the main branch, you know, that of the shadows. And then we have the darkest little cavity, which is this little this little pinch. And then we shrink our brush as we apply. We're trying not to get it too dark on these inner areas. I'll adjust them later if they're not using the right value. And then I'm climbing like a sand pile on the top of its little head. I'm climbing that 
extra value. And here, this little guy, this little highest point, see this highest point reaching out the most? That's where the core shadow starts for this piece. It's just one sphere on top of another sphere on top of another sphere. And you're kind of preparing yourself for these. So we'll move on to critiquing other pieces in a second. See how this is almost a point? We're reaching it into a point. Just two words there, I just need a brighter value. And it's kind of like little stairs. And if the light was coming from an angle instead, this shadow would sit up there and then we'd have a little cast shadow there. But instead we're not, we're not doing that, it's just directly head down, overhead down, sorry. And then this merges into that. This pinch kind of unifies with this one. Same thing on this side. This pinch kind of extends into this. And then we have one last little bump revealing there. And then I would just identify how dark I want to go. Because the background is so bright, I'm not letting a lot of these shadows go down that low. But each shadow of every stair should be darker and darker than the next one. And then we have the brightest point sitting right at the top. Oh, and if it's all the way around, if it's like directly overhead, around the shape right here, like this little knob, we have more volume. Okay, so that's kind of what I would recommend for students who are trying to break out of the simple form studies to try to just throw yourself these hard balls. You're never really going to have a form study that looks like this, and it's just a great way to exercise your brain. It's a good way to test yourself. If you're kind of moving into advanced, you're kind of getting bored of all the same old stuff. But you also have a bit of a difficult time writing a story or building a narrative for an illustration, but you still want to do work on your art. You still want to figure out what you need to focus on. And that's if the light was top down. If it was angled in any other direction, then you just make sure you're, you're shifting the new highest point in relation. So it's a high point in relation to the light source. So this would be the new high point in relation to the light source. And then all the shadows over here would move on if the light source was from this side. All right, this would be the new high point. And then we'd have the pocket, and then we'd have all these shadows here. You can use the same shape and change the light source as you need to. The cast shadow starts off sharp, and then continues off soft. We would still have that essential pinch denying the light. And then you would just climb your values accordingly. Any questions at all? <clears throat> Do you use transfer on your blocking brushes? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have to check. Cast shadows are also with soft brush. For a, so for a, a globular shape, yes, soft brush. For an, orga for an organic shape, always soft brush. Um, for a non-organic shape, just use your blocking brush. You don't use a round tool to do, to, 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 it, to, to do a square job. <laughs> you don't do a, you, you don't do, a, you don't use a square job to do a round. Blocking is a block, it's square. I think the bounce light would just actually sit somewhere on this surface here. A little bit on this surface, leaving behind that terminator. But at this point I'm having too much fun. All right, um, so we are looking at these pieces. What I don't understand about this one is how you are, what you're doing with this section here. Are these paper flaps like folding out? I see a lot of paper flaps. The best thing it could have done is just add a little bit of extra shape here on the far side. It would have had the same color as this guy. 
right here and then this extra unusual shadow with this whole section here would have been exposed to the light source if the light was coming from top down which it is and then this guy here would be displaced from the light source would probably have the same almost value as the far side because look at what this guy is doing so it would probably be something in between here and then slightly exposed of course because it's not exactly the same surface as this and that means this surface area is relieving the shadow off this section because look how bright your background is your background is saying that everything is just bright enough to reveal all these aspects here all these components and uh Cleaning up the edge. Oops. All right. So that's just that's just how your you know your problem solving skills. That's what's developed in your form studies. Art is problem solving. You do a bad brush or two, you go back and fix it. You do a bad brush or two, you go back and fix it. You do one really good brush stroke, great, move on. Do another bad one, um, and then you're just constantly solving your problems, constantly adjusting choices that you made until it looks similar to what you imagined, or it just looks right to you. A bit, little bit, a little bit of bounce light there. I think this surface is too dark. Um, it's not bad. It's just a little too uh, dark in this section. Okay, and then we have. Uh, this piece here, this one, I already talked about this one. Um, for the backgrounds here, using such extreme whites, but your background value is so dark, it's really making no sense to some of this stuff. Um, so some of these are actually the right value. So this one, for instance, apart from these, this one, the background is the right value for this one. The black looks like it's actual changes in color in the rock. Uh, don't bring in random changes that don't if you go too dark too soon or too light too soon it looks like you painted those area instead of it being um, just the natural shadow progression um, so the best way for me to fix these again you have these little little random flaps like little paper flaps that makes no makes no that make no sense so what you have to do is just add a little section to them just like that to show that they do have you know an inside to them to complete the shape then you have again this is the same thing I was talking about before it kind of just moves into a paper flap just cut it off so that it doesn't look like an added little paper flap okay um, this pure white pure black makes no sense if the light was bright enough to reveal the top side this much it would also be moving into this interior section just like that um, and then we have this area with the light coming from the front. Um, if this was the background value, the bounce light would come in and illuminate all of that. It's just too bright again, unless someone came in and specifically painted only the top side of this rock. Right, and that's kind of, maybe it's an ice structure and a sunset time. Um, but then that would mean that we have this section a little bit bright as well, catching some light as the sun set, um, the way it's catching the light up here. And this section here too, kind of all moving in the same direction, because if we drew an arrow, it would be the same arrow moving out of this whole little belly section and it would all catch the same light. Parallel arrows share the same value. Uh, write that down. Any questions at all? It's getting a little bit crazy when it comes to form studies uh, because it, 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 it's, it, you, you establish the rule and you memorize it, but you're like, do I really have to verbally memorize all this, write it on the list and put it in front of my desktop? For some students, yes, absolutely. That is exactly what you have to do. Um, but for other students, it's an instinct. You will build your instinct, but you can't build it unless you've exposed yourself to the elements. And these are the elements. Form studies is the environment that you're exposing yourself to developing this instinct around what looks light, what looks right, what feels dark, um, what needs to be darkened a little bit, etc. 
Um, when should we stop using references to, for form studies? Start off with no references. This is all theory right now. If you use references, you're going to be focusing less on theory and more on, I have to make sure I need to copy the same value here. Is it close? No, not yet. Let me adjust it. Okay, now it is close. And that's all that copying from a reference is. Um, but when you're using no reference, you're actually asking, okay, so what the heck, what value do I have? What, what am I even doing? What am I doing here? <laughs> do I really want to draw? Yes. Okay. So form study is mandatory. Now I have to choose a base value. Um, I want it to be slightly dark red. So I'm going to choose a nice, rich, uh, gray value, like a charcoal-y gray. And then I want it to be a texture that is really, really sharp, like an onyx type material and then I want the light source to be here it is going to be very reflective I'll take care of those reflective surfaces later I just want to capture general core shadow um, so I'm going to you know, lay down a core shadow here 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 which angle do I really start the core shadow where it's supposed to be wouldn't the surface be just a little bit darker and then you're actually asking questions critical questions where if you use a reference you're just copying back and forth back and forth and you're not really formulating you're not building an instinct Working from reference is great. Using still life references are great, but what I want to build are strong artists who have a strong language in identifying values. And they're not gonna be strong artists if I'm, even the fundamentals that you need a reference for them. Um, like when it comes to basic grayscales, like even grayscale blobs, they need a reference. You shouldn't need a reference that much. After identifying a light environment and thinking about the arrows, um, you should be able to answer a lot of these questions yourselves and you have critiques and the critique community um, There's all of that speaking of the critique critique community. Please make sure you join the reddit The link is up here. Please join the reddit if you want your work looked at everything I looked at today I did not look here The only reason why we're keeping this up and posting here still is because just in case Google plus might not shut down uh, But uh, but it might and I want everyone to move over here. So we're hitting half a thousand as soon as it gets to be a thousand members, I'll stop annoying you guys with this because I know there's like a thousand actives uh, right now on this community. So I told you guys, a lot of the members here never visited again. They just joined. Um, so make sure you guys are, or if you are active, if you want your work looked at, if you want to respond to today's lesson and work on some form studies. Um, I know we, the ones we did together were very, very fast, but you guys will have more time to really think about them, put some uh, pieces beside to create some bounce light, lighten and darken the background, take your time. Uh, don't rush through it like me. This is all just instruction and general demonstration. Do not rush. I'm not a reference for how things should go. I work pretty closely when there isn't a camera shining on me. Um, I, I, I take my time and I really think about it. Even the shape, I take my time deciding what shape it's going to be. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. So I hope today's class helped you guys. Thank you everyone for joining. Any last questions? How bright should the highest point of a form be relevant, relevant to the, relative to the light environment? Uh, it depends on how reflective the object is and what color its base tone is. If it's a dark mid-tone, it's not gonna get that bright. It's just gonna be a, a relative lightness. Um, sometimes leaving it matte is the best thing to do. Um, what, are, what are the best forms to work with when it comes to form studies? Sphere, cylinder, I uh, would work on those second. I'd prioritize the cube and prisms, pyramid, um, and then add any more, combine a cube and a pyramid, um, and just work from there. Uh, use all the same shape, just tilt it in different angles and in one light source. Keep your light source the same in your form studies in one environment. Um, uh, because you want to learn how to paint an illustration, reference everything off the same sun. Um, <clears throat> so if we choose the material like rock, we should keep rigid transformation of planes. Absolutely, you're studying the texture. The texture is all to do with its external um, silhouette and its contours as well as its internal patterns and value changes. Could you elaborate on what you said about using soft brush for cast shadows on an organic form? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, what do you mean? Why I use this sh a soft brush? Oh, I work fast for critique hours, so I'm always using a soft brush as much as possible. 
Um, but the cast shadow, you mean if it was sharper, if it was a really sharp cast shadow? I would use a blocking brush if it was a really exposed, bright white object with a white background-ish thing and a cast shadow that's sharp. I was just using a very soft environment value, so I was using my soft brush. How do you explain, can you explain how to do curved surfaces, organic shapes? I just did that. You're going to have to watch the recording to catch that. Um, uh, that's it. Thank you everyone for watching. If you guys want to be patrons, you can go to istabrak.com and click on the little Patreon uh, icon here to join as a patron. Our assignments have already been sent out for character design, uh, busts, and portraits. Um, and I do expect all writing assignments handed in as well. So it's also a writing assignment, a creative writing assignment. Um, please make sure you join uh, the Reddit. Um, the villain design will be up soon. And February 1st will be the first release date of Mac. Uh, Portrait Studio for Mac. So for anyone who wants Portrait Studio and has a PC or has been waiting for a Mac release, um, uh, it will be released on the 1st. Thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you guys. Uh, bye.